I would like to invite Brian Keating to speak about the adventure that lies ahead for those who are going to join us. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and, and very exciting to be uh, asked to be involved in this Kilimanjaro climb. It's, um, I've been traveling to Africa since 1983 and uh, it's really my home away from home. And uh, usually, pretty well every year, I've flown past the summit of Kilimanjaro, and it's brought back lots of good memories. In 1999, I went up Kilimanjaro, up the western breach, and across to the summit, and then down the route that we're going to be climbing up. So it's, uh, it's going to be very exciting to get back onto the mountain. And, I, you know, I had climbed Mount Kenya in earlier years, uh, and I thought that I had sort of fulfilled my high alpine equatorial African needs. And then a good friend of mine said, let's go to Kilimanjaro. And I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, so I found myself there uh, for, this, for this climb. And I didn't realize how important it was to be on Kilimanjaro until I was climbing up Kilimanjaro. It's a, a stunningly beautiful mountain. And the uh, various zones of vegetation that you go through to get up to the uh, up into the Alpine are are fantastic. The um, there's a, a lot of biological diversity on the mountain itself. Not a lot of endemic plant life or animal life on the mount on the mountain, but the colobus monkeys that live in the tropical forests around the edge of the mountain have a cape coloration that's different than other colobus monkeys in other parts of Africa. Uh, Kilimanjaro is essentially an island. Uh, it's it's the I think it's the it's considered to be the largest single freestanding mountain in the world because it's, uh, it's so big and so lone. Uh, but because of that, it's created an island that has allowed for a certain amount of endemic life to occur. So there's the fireball lily that's found in the forest is found only on Kilimanjaro. Uh, and there's a number of other plants as well. But the forest itself is, is beautiful. Colobus monkeys that I've seen in the forest, it's some of the best colobus monkey watching I've ever had. Colobus, colobus monkeys are the black and white monkeys of Africa. They're the ones with the long flowing black and white hair. They are leaf eating monkeys. And because of that, they don't get a lot of nutrients from the leaves. They spend a lot of time sitting around and uh, snoozing or relaxing. And so they're one of the most approachable monkeys, at least they usually are. And on Kilimanjaro, I've had some of the best monkey watching I've ever had. So that's, that's the forest regime that we go through. Interesting birds like taracos, uh, which are very large parrot-like birds uh, that uh, scamper like a squirrel on the branches of the trees. Uh, and they're fruit-eating birds. They've got blood-red underwings when they fly, and uh, they're frequently seen in the forest on the way up. And then you gradually move out of the forest into the heath zone, and this is sort of uh, the equivalent of our subalpine, I suppose, or, our, or right into the alpine zone, except instead of um, uh, plants being this big, plants are taller than we stand. So the, the heath zone is, is equatorial African style. And then you eventually get up into the, into the, 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 the zone of, of lichen and uh, then finally up into the ice zone up near the summit. So th from that perspective, from a biological perspective, the mountain is, is very interesting. Just from the history perspective, it's, I think, a, a fascinating mountain to be on. It was first climbed in the late 1800s. And uh, then there was a 20-year period of time that it wasn't climbed again. Uh, and, it's, and in those days when, when, uh, when climbers did make it to the summit, they looked down into a caldera that was filled with ice. Now most of that ice is gone. In fact, it, in all likelihood, all the ice will be gone off the summit within about 35 years, maybe even as little as 15 years from now. So it's, I think it's important to see the mountain now. Uh, the, 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 the summit is strikingly beautiful because of the ice that's up there. And I think it'll be a different mountain when the ice is gone. So uh, from that perspective, it's important. Also, from the perspective of the fact that the mountain is a major draw, a lot of tourists go there. A lot of people climb Kilimanjaro, and for good reason. It's considered to be an easy mountain. It's a walk-up mountain. However, don't let that fool you. Uh, any mountain that goes that high it can be a real challenge. It's uh, 19,350 feet, so what, 5,895 meters. That's a long ways up. Now, most of the days are done uh, in fairly small jumps, and we spend three days camped at the same elevation pretty well, about 4,100 meters, which is good because that'll give us a chance to acclimatize before we do the last day, which will be a long push to the summit and then back. It'll be a long day. 
but the um, most days are about four or five hours, maybe six hours of hiking, uh, which means there's lots of time <coughs> to just enjoy the camp and get to know the, the, the uh, plant life and the few birds that are around. Uh, there's little mountain chats that'll keep us company at every camp. Uh, and now and again, we might be lucky enough to see the lammergeier fly over, which is the, the bearded vulture that, uh, that lives up on those high elevation environments. Not a lot of bird life up in the high country, but a stunningly beautiful mountain. So I put together a video that's 17 minutes long, and it'll take you on the hike that I did 15 years ago when I climbed Kilimanjaro. And I was, uh, it, was, it was about a decade prior to that that I had climbed Mount Kenya. And I was just on Mount Kenya again just, this, uh, just a few months ago at about 11,800 feet. So I didn't go all the way to the summit, but we stayed way up high on a, a, a cabin. Uh, both the mountains are considered to be sister mountains. Of course, Kilimanjaro is the highest. Kil uh, Mount Kenya is around 17,500 feet. So it's uh, quite a bit smaller than uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. But let me take you up onto the, 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 the flanks of, uh, of Kilimanjaro. So this was filmed in 1999. And if I don't know if we could have the lights down just a touch, that would be handy. So we went via the Shura Plateau and the Western Breach Route. And the Western Breach is a hard rock climb, so it's very steep. Uh, the route One of the that things that I find fascinating about these high mountains is the changes in the bands of vegetation. In Kilimanjaro, you start in the savanna, where there's elephants and giraffe and zebra and all kinds of antelope. Then you go up into the tropical forest environment around the lower flanks of Kilimanjaro. And then you end up in the heathland, eventually the moorland, and then the alpine zone. And way up high, the glacier zone, where virtually no life exists except the odd climber. So here we are now in the lower flanks. Kilimanjaro is actually a very important mountain because of all the moisture that emanates off the flanks down into the grasslands and into the forests below. And it supports a huge variety of life uh, around the base of the mountain and out into the Serengeti. And, uh, and there'll be an opportunity for those of you who want to stay on to go on a safari out into the country, which I highly recommend. This is Africa for me, like I said before, is my home away from home. I've been traveling here since 1983, and it's uh, spectacular. That's the Saddlebill Stork, one of the prettiest storks on the planet. Impala in their numbers. Giraffe in good numbers. That's the Maasai Giraffe, the subspecies that's down uh, in uh, this part of Africa. And the reticulated giraffe seen here uh, found in northern Kenya, uh, but the other ones were the Maasai Giraffe that you'll see in the Maasai Mara. Good numbers of lions. Uh, and to just to get close to watch the different animals uh, and to see some of the behavior. Here's a couple of young elephants that were facing off, pushing each other around. And, uh, and cattle egrets accompanying some of the Cape buffalo, picking up insects that the buffalo scare up. A cheetah here, there's good chances of seeing cheetah. Of course, the Serengeti ecosystem is famous for the populations of cheetah. And this trip is planned at the right time of the year for seeing the migration uh, in the Tanzanian side of the Serengeti. And since you're in Tanzania anyway, I would recommend you just stay there. Don't bother going up into Kenya, but rather travel out into the Serengeti. That's a uh, Caracal cat and some Impala right at sunset. So that's what's around the flanks. And I've got another video I'm going to show you in a few minutes on that. Now this is how we prepared uh, in 1999. We met at a lodge and got everything organized. We had some blue monkeys watching us. They actually woke us up at 5.30 in the morning by jumping on the tin roof of our lodge. And uh, these are fruit-eating monkeys, which means they're, uh, they've got a big brain, they're quick thinking, they're fast, and somewhat hyperactive. Uh, and uh, so they, they kept us entertained for the morning as we were packing up our vehicles. And then we headed the 15 or so kilometers up the flanks of Kilimanjaro to about 10,000 feet to Londorosi Gate, which is where we entered the uh, Kilimanjaro National Park. And we were greeted there by about, oh, seven or 800 villagers uh, that were curious about our presence. And uh, then our, our guide did the paperwork uh, and hired the porters. And we, we actually hired 36 porters for 14 people. I felt like I was on an, a turn of the century Himalayan climb. It was quite exciting. And here's, here's now in the forest, that forest band that I mentioned. There's Protea, the flower of South Africa. Uh, but uh, there's a species, a, a, uh, an endemic species of Protea. That's the fireball lily that I was telling you about. Also endemic 
uh, subspecies uh, found in the forests of uh, that band of trees that surround like a donut, uh, the lower flanks of Kilimanjaro. Up to about 3,000 meters, the forest exists. It's a uh, montane, tropical, broadleafed forest. Some big trees. Uh, there's the colobus. Uh, I think they, well, they're one of my favorite monkeys for sure. Long, flowing, beautiful white fluffy tail and very long cape of white fur. Uh, and interesting, they almost look like they're a monk or some sort of religious uh, creature up in the trees. They're, they're dressed like they should be going to a Sunday sermon. It's been theorized that that long hair mimics the long hair of the, or the long lichens that grow in the trees. And, uh, and you can see them here uh, in a family group doing some grooming. Then we drove up through some of the heath to our, our start off point. So we started at about 10 and a half thousand feet and we really just did, the, the, our first day of hiking was pretty well at the same elevation. Uh, so we bounced our way up, uh, taking off about a thousand vertical feet off of our initial climb. Uh, sitting on the vehicle and in the vehicle, just enjoying the landscape up into the Shura Plateau. And then, this was fascinating, our 36 porters then started to distribute the weight between them. And it was best that we just stand back, uh, because obviously we don't under understand what's going on, but there were some interesting discussions happening between the head porters and the other porters, until they finally got it all figured out. And, uh, and we saw some of the less experienced porters being given the heaviest loads by the more experienced porters. It was quite amusing and interesting to see them smoking cigarettes at 11,000 feet. <laughs> and, uh, and I saw in the foreground there uh, a friend of mine from Zimbabwe, a fellow by the name of Gordon. He was 72 years old on this trip and he made it to the summit. And he just sent me an email the other day apologizing that he can't make it on this trip. He's now 87. Anyway, here we are, hiking off now. You can see the fog has settled in. And honestly, I felt like I was zapped back 100 years into a classic Himalayan climb. Watching our porters pass us, we had started off hiking through the heath zone. And then all these guys started to walk past. And it was quite amazing watching this group of people uh, all with, our, with the, our gear. We were just carrying light day packs, which is how we'll do this climb uh, in uh, next, next year. Uh, and that allows for uh, just setting a nice pace. And the first Swahili word you'll learn is pole pole, which means slowly, slowly. And the guides are constantly saying pole pole. Even though you may feel like you want to move faster, you shouldn't. The, the whole idea is to spend a long time on the mountain. The more time we spend on the mountain, the better. Uh, if, uh, those climbers that try to do the mountain in three and a half days usually end up throwing up all the way to the summit or not making it to the summit. We're spending eight days on the mountain, and that's very important. That will up our statistical chance. That's a uh, leopard scat that you saw there. So leopards prowl, and they were eating small mice. That's uh, so the, the, the jaws, and that's a dung beetle, for those of you who are interested in beetles. Uh, <laughs> on the dung, of course. And we found evidence of, of uh, buffalo here. So we asked our guide. So this is what the buffalo come up for, eh? The buffalo come up. Oh yes, the buffalo used to come up and collect these. Even antelopes, some antelopes. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. From time to time during the evening times. And once it is very shining, they used to come and collect. Huh. It's the Yamane to their body. Right. Oh right. yes. Wow. Now I don't know what the uh, manner of the tail body is. I've always been trying to I've tried to figure that out several times, and I've asked a few Swahili-speaking friends, and they couldn't tell me. But uh, that's okay. It was wonderful to see evidence of buffalo. This is a, a skink. It was the last reptile we saw on the mountain before we left the heath zone, or at least uh, went up into the vertical elevations. But this little skink was sunning himself uh, with the brief sun that we were getting. The the summit of Kilimanjaro in tantalizing ways would appear and disappear behind the clouds. Usually the morning started off clear blue sky and then it would cloud by the middle of the day. That's a lamagire. That is the vulture that is adapted for eating the chips of bones. It carries bones up high, drops the bones into what they call ossuaries, smashes the bones and eats the bone fragments. So it's a bizarre vulture and they only live high on mountain and craggy cliffs like this. So here's our first camp and it, it, right in the Sheriff Plateau at about 11,000 feet. So at about the summit of, uh, of um, Mount Victoria. 
So think about that. And uh, and here we are. It's still you can see there's heath around, and our our guides were using wood. I'm not sure if they'll be using wood on the trip that we're doing. Probably not. Uh, but this was 15 years ago, and in an area, a part of the mountain that was seldom used by climbers. So, but we uh, we you notice there was there was frost all over everything. So it was already below freezing at nighttime here as soon as the sun came up and started. Uh, you could feel the warmth of the sun right away, and the frost started to melt off the plants and the tent. And then we left. And the camp staff took down our tents. All we had to do was stuff our sleeping bags. And we had breakfast for us, and then we started to hike. And that's the way it's going to work next year on this climb. So we would then go. You can see the pace that we set, very slow, hiking four to five hours a day. And, uh, and for several days, we would spend, like at this one, this is uh, um, a camp that's looking over at uh, Mount Meru. And we spent two nights there, hiking high and then coming back to the camp to acclimatize to the elevation. And then we were off to the higher camp. And, uh, and so we're leaving now the heath zone. It's a lava tube that I climbed into to photograph my friends hiking past us. Of course, then the porters passed us. You know, it, it, we're carrying light loads and walking very slowly. These guys are so used to the elevation and so fit. It was just amazing. And uh, looking back down at the clouds billowing around, uh, obliterating the, uh, the, the grasslands beyond, finding these bizarre plants uh, like uh, giant lobelia. Uh, and uh, these are these are plants found only above three and a half or four thousand well above three and a half thousand meters in elevation uh, one of those unique plants of equatorial Africa then we found a two buffalo skeletons at 16,000 feet, and the story is that they were likely struck by lightning. But what buffalo were doing up there in the first place is beyond me. And then our final push, and we're now up to uh, about uh, almost 17,000 feet, uh, or 16,500 feet, and uh, the clouds were, were settled down below us. I felt like I was at 30,000 feet uh, in a jet aircraft looking down at the tops of the clouds. The sun set, of course, around 6.30 in the evening, and at midnight we were up and climbing. We started with headlamps, and then this guy broke out in song. This is Ruben, our guide. What a hoot. And that lifted everybody's spirits. And it was at about that time when he was detecting that people were getting a little down, a little tired. We'd been climbing since midnight. It's now sunrise. But then we crested onto the caldera. And this was absolutely thrilling. Uh, and, and now we're in the official ice zone. So this is where the, the last of the glacial remnants are at their thickest uh, depth. And uh, we're right in the caldera. We're still 300 meters away from the summit. Uh, but uh, this was a crystalline landscape of absolute beauty. Vertical walls of ice melted by the equatorial sun uh, and, uh, and, and just stunningly beautiful in, at the crack of dawn. Uh, and uh, and still and now very cold. You know, it was probably about negative 15 degrees at this point. But there was no wind, so we were blessed with a calm day. And we walked through this crystalline landscape. And remember, many of my friends. I've got a couple of friends from South Africa here, a couple of Zimbabwe friends, a Tanzanian friend. None of them had ever seen ice before of this magnitude. This is the first glacier ice they had ever come across. So they were quite thrilled. And there's my wife and my buddy from Zimbabwe climbing up the last little bit up onto the summit. And this is. Uh, there's, there's uh, one of the craters in the bottom of the main crater. You can see the wall of ice on the other side. We walked through this bizarre uh, landscape of, of ice pinnacles that had melted out from the snowfall that occurred the winter before. And under the equatorial sun, these little sculptures occur with the dry wind. And I suspect it's caused mostly from sublimation. So not actual melting of the ice, but it sublimates into these bizarre forms. There's our guide coming up carrying my 72 year old friend's pack I must say but that's okay and there's these bizarre ice forms that uh, if you hit one you would knock down 20 or 30 of them like dominoes 
and uh, and that's not that uncommon in equatorial uh, ice landscapes where the sun beats down from virtually directly above. It creates this bizarre uh, landscape. You have to walk between these little dry channels. And here's the summit, the view from the summit. The beautiful ice, some of it collapsing down. Uh, we had been down there earlier before. And the summit, the summit view. And there we are, the highest point in Africa, 5,895 meters, so about 19,350 feet. Uh, that old sign has been since uh, uh, changed for a new one, so we'll see a new sign. There's the two ladies on our trip, and there's my good buddy Garth on the left with his two ladies. And uh, well, this is Willem, one of my friends. He didn't know that he made it to the summit until I showed him the video. And, uh, and there's my, my buddy Edward from, the, uh, from Britain. And I'll tell you a story about him later on. But uh, here's my wife and I doing a 360 on the summit. <laughs> we, did <it. laughs> we did it. Well done. Well done. <laughs> and there's Edward. And we propped Edward up for a photo saying that we have to show your wife, Edward, that you made it to the top. And he's, as we were propping him up, he said, you're so selfless. <laughs> Classic Brit. Anyway, another lovely uh, bits of, of video from the summit. You can see how beautiful it is. And, uh, and then we started to descend down. Now, this is the route that we'll be coming up. So we'll be passing by these ice walls. You can see these massive waterfalls of frozen ice. Some of those, uh, those icicles are probably 10 meters in length or maybe even longer off in the distance. And my wife is maneuvering her way through the snow pinnacles as we're descending down. Uh, you, whenever you knocked one over, you felt kind of bad, you know? It's sort of like uh, breaking something classy in a jewelry store or in a china shop. And here we are descending down, and that's the route that we're going to be coming up. You can tell our guides are about to get tipped. Yesterday, we climbed and descended 14,000 feet. 4,000 feet of climbing, 10,000 foot of descent. Last night, we slept incredibly well after virtually maybe two hours of sleep in 24 hours. Everybody's feeling really good. Now we're descending down through this lush, verdant tropical forest. Our hemoglobin content is up and our red blood cell count is high. I think we're all high on oxygen. And then, then this, is, this, this is just after we took the quarters. And that's the Kilimanjaro climb. Thank you very much, everybody.